So there exist a variety of life cycle models. Um, the first one, and kind of oldest one, is the waterfall process model. Yeah. It says, okay, I'm going to look at, I'm going to analyze my requirements first. It results in specifications. Basically, specification, I'm going to you know, put a design together and, and implement it, then test the design, and then finally, I'm going to maintain it when the, after the user, of course, starts utilizing it. Yeah. Well, besides this traditional waterfall model, there's, there's two others that um, I have included here. One is the spiral process model. And what's interesting is which it starts, you know, rather than looking at the, the waterfall, I'm kind of wrapping it up. I start with a need. And then, of course, the life cycle, like, kind of progresses along the spiral. And what's very interesting is that along the radials of the spiral are indicated kind of the similar activities. You know, for example, you see here the system requirements, determination, function definition, detail requirements, implementation. So this gives you, starts increasing the level of detail at each point. Yeah. Same thing here. We say, okay, feasibility analysis. We're going to say we're going to allocate requirements, design components, you know, analyze the system, trade studies, evaluation, optimizations. There, it's at a, an increased level of detail along the way when you actually move from the inside of the spiral to the outside. Yeah. Now, there's another thing that you see here, which is actually there's a strong focus in the spiral model on prototypes. You know, you can design a system prototype, you're going to synthesize that, and then you're going to come up with an operational prototype you can actually use in an operational environment, and of course, also evaluate an operational environment. I put, uh, I think, a more detailed paper that talks about the spiral process model on Blackboard. Now, one model that we're going to use a lot within this course is the V process model. It's kind of like, it looks like a waterfall. You, you know, you find system requirements. Oops. Um, you, you know, you break the systems down into sub-functions that you're going to define. Then you can design uh, the components. And then, of course, you're going to build it all and you're going to verify the components, verify the subsystems verify the whole system and then also what's missing here of course is the validation you're going to make sure that the system is actually doing what it's supposed to do now the reason this is v is because it kind of looks at a looks like a standard waterfall curve you know you have a decomposition sequence you go from system to subsystem to component and on the other side an upward going branch here is the verification and validation branch you verify at increased level. So you're going to go verify the components first, then the subsystems, then the whole full system. And you know we're going to be talking a lot more about this V process model throughout the remainder of this course. Okay, so let's look start looking at our original uh, diagram here. So look at the top phase, conceptual design, preliminary design, detailed design. Let's look at each of these a little bit more details. Now in the conceptual design you're really going to focus a lot. You're going to focus a lot on identifying whatever it is the customer needs. Then, after you establish that there is a customer need, you're going to check out: okay, can, is it feasible to build a system for this? We call this a system feasibility analysis. Then, when you're done with that and it is feasible, uh, you're going to say: okay, let me start to actually put together a set of requirements, you know, a set of statements that describe what it is that the system needs to do. And of course. There's a variety of different requirements that exist. Operational requirements, maintenance support requirements. In other words, what kind of maintenance is required or what kind of support is required for this particular system. A functional requirement, technical performance measures, and a variety more. And we'll talk about these some more in the later part of this, this course. Then, of course, after you're done with all these requirements, you more or less are done with what we call the system specifications. And you go to what is referred to as the conceptual design review, where you go and review all the requirements and the basic concepts that you came up with. Now what's neat, important to realize is that all the stuff that you're doing in conceptual design is at the system level. Okay? And a very important thing that's part of the conceptual design is to actually write down a come-ups document, a concept operations document. Okay? This is not required, of course, but it's for a lot of different projects this is often done. And the ConOps really describes, okay, 
I need something. The customer needs something. So what operational environment am I thinking of? How am I going to use this? You know? Example, if you have a fridge, you know what? It's going to be sitting in my kitchen. It's going to be connected to the outlets. I'm going to be going, opening the door and closing the door. You know, you kind of tell you, okay, what does this thing need to do? What does the customer really want to do? What's the operational idea? Yeah. Now, so a couple of things in the terminology-wise. Typically, we start out with needs, like we, we, we saw on the top. Then we're going to turn these needs into goals, objectives, constraints, and, of course, in the end, requirements, like we did in this particular now, in real life, you see what goals are often referred to as objectives, and objectives are often referred to as performance measures or measures of effectiveness. This terminology is really depending a lot of times on the company you work for or the terminology that you want to adopt if you are the sole responsible for this, this product. Okay, but the first thing is always very important is definition of the need. Is the system that I'm thinking of, is there a need for this? You know, typically what you want to do is you want a need to drive, uh, the, you know, need to be the, the driving factor. You know, your system must be needed, otherwise, there's no sense in making it because you want to be able to sell it. So you make, you want to actually identify the customer and identify what it is he really needs. And this often results in a need statement. So examples are I mean, very simple examples. Childproof pill containers are too difficult for people with arthritis to open. This kind of just identify a need, a problem at hand that requires some system or some solution. Houses become uncomfortable hot during summer afternoons or travel between Athens and Columbus too show, too slow. There's nothing here that says, okay, what the system is that I need. It just identifies that there is a need for some means uh, to travel between Athens and Columbus that's faster than the current need. Okay? And what you see a lot of cases in these need statements is that it's typical or generally expressed as a dissatisfaction with the current situation. Okay? Now the need statement often results in a goal statement, you know, so which is a brief general and ideal response to the need statement. You know, for example, we saw the, the case that we had a childproof pill containers are too difficult for people with arthritis to open. So a goal would be design a childproof pill bottle that's easier to open. Okay. So and of course there is a variety depending on what your team comes up with. There's a variety of different uh, ways to to describe this goal statement. Okay. You know, so what you're really doing in this particular when you define your goal statement, you define the problem. Okay. The problem is defining your goal statement. So here's a couple more examples. The second one, for example, the slow transportation example could be design a high-speed railway connection between Athens and Columbus. Well, this doesn't necessarily mean that this solution or this way, I mean, this, you know, this goal is achievable. You still need to do a feasibility study of, of this particular thing. Maybe uh, you find out in the feasibility study that the high-speed railway connection would be way too expensive to implement. So after, so we saw, previously we saw, okay, there's a need, okay, and there's goals, and next there's objectives. Okay? If you look at objectives, these are really quantifiable expectations of performance. Okay? Um, so let's look at an example. So suppose we look at a need statement that uh, gives you, or that the following need statement has too, many, too much damage to cars in the front of collision. And there's a dissatisfaction, there's a problem identified. So the goal would be, okay, design and improve from bumper. It's a very, very fuzzy goal here. But objectives could be kind of performance measures associated with this goal. You know, this improve from bumper, this design must be inexpensive, you know, must be providing no significant damage to the bumper, it also must result that there is a collision, there's no significant damage to other car parts. It must be recyclable. You must, you know, you must retain maneuverability of the vehicle, you must retain braking capability, and there may be a ton more. But the thing about these objectives is that you can measure them. You know, you can measure uh, how in an expensive portion in terms of dollars. 
you know, bump, bumper damage. You know, you can actually find out, okay, how far the bump was pushed in when there was a collision. And you can express that in centimeters. And then what you need to say, you need to set up a threshold, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, et cetera, et cetera. But the objectives definitely are quanti more quantifiable. That's why we often refer to these things as you know, performance measures or measures of, of, of effectiveness. Now, another thing that you need to define is your system boundaries, your constraints. You need to identify, okay, what is part of my system and what isn't. So if I have my system, you know, some third things will be included, some tasks, some functions, what else won't be. Yeah? Then later we can actually take this system and break it down in, in subsystem components. So at the same time, so you need to really clearly identify the system boundary. What's part of the system, what is not. At the same time, we're also starting to identify what are the inputs of my system and the outputs of my system. Now, of course, with the computer system, you can clearly identify there must be some form of inputs. You want to have the keyboard, the outputs maybe the, the, the display, but there may be other inputs or outputs as well in terms of I.O. devices. So you need to kind of identify what it is that you um, want to go in and out of the system. Now, as I said before, the next important part of the conceptual design, and actually more, even more important, and this is very important, is to, to check out if it's even feasible. You know, what I actually set up in the goal statement, can I, can I really do that? Do you want to really think about it as, I have a problem, and I want to look for a solution. You don't really want to say, okay, I have a solution, I'm going to find a problem. I'm looking for a problem, but it's really not the right approach. So we'll get back all this stuff a little bit later. So at the end, when you're done, you come up with a set of system requirements. And then what you kind of want to do is you want to kind of review those, kind of in a formal manner. You want to just say, okay, the system that we came up with, you know, we set the needs, we set goals, we set objectives, and we came up with a set, we determined it was feasible. And if it is, we came up with a set of requirements, and that requirements need to be kind of formally reviewed. And at this point, for example, within the company, management be, will be involved to check out, okay, is this really, uh, or the customer may even be involved, to check out, is this really satisfying our need? On this slide, I'm identifying some of the documentation. You'll find out with all these life cycle processes, we will be generating quite a lot of documentation. We saw in the conceptual design, we had the CONOPS document. Why do we want to do this? Where does this thing need to be? How do we need to operate it? Then we identify the system requirements and describe what is the system we're going to do. And then later on, you know, I don't know why I put it right here, we're going to say how we're going to get that implemented. So the next step would be the preliminary design. And the preliminary design is really at the subsystem level. So during the conceptual design, we design the system, we came up with what is the system needs to do. Now we're going to go to the next level of detail, the subsystem level, and we're going to identify what it is that needs to be done at the subsystem level. Okay? So you're going to perform a functional analysis, you're going to check out what kind of subsystems are required, and what are the functions of these subsystems. Then what you're going to do is you're going to refine the requirements and allocate these refined requirements to system requirements that you already had established. And then what you're going to do is you're going to check out, you're going to actually look at the how. How am I going to implement these subsystems? And this is where you're going to actually start looking at things like trade studies. You're going to see what would be possible detailed solutions, and you're answering the how question, to for these subsystems. Then, of course, you need to put it all together. I need to pull up the system synthesis and definition. And so you'll end up with a detailed specification maybe even a set of analysis, and maybe even a prototype. Okay. At the end, again, just like we did with conceptual design, we'll need a, pro, a design review. So at, at this design review, you'll have system requirements, so requirements at the system level. You'll also set of requirements at the subsystem level, and you'll also have kind of laid out a couple of possible solutions or answering how you're going to implement each of these 
the subsystems. So that's what I can say here. Now, of course, at the detailed design, you really go to the last level. Well, you can actually find out really how am I going to implement these subsystems. You can, you're working at the component level. So you kind of, you know, you take whatever you had at the, from the trade study and you're going to, you know, come up with a detailed design of the functional system. Then you're going to define maybe a very detailed prototype. And what you may want to do is you want to test and evaluate this prototype in a relevant operational environment. Yeah? And then when that all works out fine, it's, uh, you know, it needs to be moved to production and construction. And what you see is during this detailed design, preliminary design, and the system design, if I can come back to there, you see there is this big feedback. At each of these blocks, you may have to provide feedback to an earlier block. That means you may find out things that you thought were okay at the, at the subsystem level that are not okay, decisions that are not okay at the detail level. Then you need to provide feedback, not just to uh, an earlier block in the same level of detail, but maybe also, in this case, at the subsystem or even system level. As part of the Oops, sorry, as part of the detailed design, of course, you're ending again with a review stage. And this is really a very important review stage because in this case, you're ending with, again, let's see if we can do that, the critical design review. You know, your detailed designs must be completed for the substance and components. You must specify the components. You must complete, you have complete all the trade studies and, see, and picked, you know, so pick the right components, really. And in this case, you see where the concourse come. You also need to come up with a fabrication plan because that is the next step. The next step is take your system and produce it, fabricate it. And of course, in this case, we typically have prototypes developed and already tested in a relevant environment. Finally, a couple of other things that you see is um, test readiness review, final design review. I'm not really going to talk about these. These are actually specific to, for example, uh, you know, our you know, senior design sequence where we actually had to go through one of these life cycles. But, uh, you know, a test readiness review would be a review to check out if your test procedures and everything is fine. 